Hey, hey, hey. Wow. What if... You got the right guy here? I don't know about that. Wow, wow. That was so kind and so unexpected. Well, hello, Journey. It is so good to see you again. Good to be with you again, uh, always. Uh, I'm John Hampton, a, a has-been pastor here at Journey and a very sad Kentucky fan. Um, in Kentucky, we don't call it March Madness anymore. We call it March Sadness because uh, that's the way it's been lately. It is so good to, to be with you. And I want to welcome all those that are joining us online from wherever you're watching from. We're so glad to have you join us today. And we want to give a special shout out to our Lake County campus. And I just want to say, Pastor Russell and Lake County, we are all cheering for you as you launch a third service every week going forward on Easter next Sunday. It's going to be awesome. Lake County is winning in so many ways. And we are so excited about that. And let me just say this. Melinda and I are so excited to be back at Journey again for Easter. We're so excited. We're coming Thursday night to the first one. We're going to come on Thursday night to that very first Easter celebration. And uh, I hope you're going to be at one of them. You can see there's one on Thursday. Uh, there's one on Saturday. There's 20 on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> Pastor Dustin's going to preach them all. He's ready. Uh, but seriously, there's a lot of opportunities to connect uh, here at Journey on Easter. What's well, my privilege today to share the final message in the Peaks and Valleys series with you. And what a fantastic series this has been. And hasn't Pastor Dustin done a masterful job of teaching these incredible messages? It's been awesome. Today, we're going to look at a spectacular mountaintop experience Jesus and some of his disciples had, followed by a spooky valley encounter. Now, the events that we're studying today in Jesus' ministry are ones that the gospel writers Matthew, Mark, and Luke record in some detail with only slight variances, and we're going to look at each of them, but we're going to start with Mark's version, which is found in Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And if you want to follow along in the Bible in your row there, that's page 866, or you can just look at the screen. Here we go. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Now to fully understand what's going on here, we need to go back into Jewish history, and I mean like way back. Centuries prior to this event, according to the book of Exodus in the Hebrew Scriptures, God came down on Mount Sinai in a cloud. Pastor Dustin taught on that very uh, subject uh, just a few weeks ago. If you haven't heard or watched that one, I encourage you to do that. The voice of God spoke out of the cloud, and everyone was afraid. Moses went to the top of the mountain to meet with God. And here's what Moses said to God. Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. But he said, this is important for our passage we're looking at, Mark, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I'll put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will remove my hand 
and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Moses could not see God's glory directly, but even coming near it was enough to make Moses' face shine with God's reflected glory that when, uh, when he came off the mountain, his face shined so brightly with God's glory that we're told he had to wear a veil over his face to keep from scaring people. Now, centuries later, we're on top of another mountain, and there's glory again. There's a mountain, a voice out of the cloud. Even Moses makes an appearance. Is this Mount Sinai all over again? No, because there's a head-spinning twist. Moses reflected the glory of God as the moon reflects the light of the sun, but Jesus produces the unsurpassable glory of God. It emanates from him. In other words, the glory of God didn't come down on Jesus. The glory of God came out of Jesus. It didn't flash down from the sky like a bolt of lightning and then suddenly disappear. Jesus' entire being emanated a sustained light that is not generated by anything in this world. That's what the phrase whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them is getting at. Friends, Jesus does not point to God's glory as Elijah and Moses and every other prophet have have done. Jesus is God's glory in human form. The glory cloud that enveloped Moses on Mount Sinai was a partial, provisional, remarkable, and helpful representation of the glory of God, but Jesus is the glory of God. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus is God's exact representation. He is the perfect, unsurpassable, unique, final revelation of God's being. He tells us who God is like nothing else does. He does not have reflective glory. He is God's glory. Now, here's a couple of implications of what that means. Number one, Jesus was not one more prophet in a long line of prophets like Moses and Elijah. He's not a prophet who's trying to get near God. He is the God all the prophets try to get near. We see this play out in this story. Mark tells us that Peter is scared spitless. So scared, he doesn't know what he's saying. And yet that doesn't stop him from talking. Here's a thought. When you don't know what to say, how about saying nothing? One of the problems with so many Christians today is they feel they need to weigh in on everything. They need to have a hot take on every social media platform and are as adamant as they are uninformed. My mama taught me that it's better to remain silent and appear foolish than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. But Peter's mama must have not told him that. Or if she did, he didn't listen. Peter apparently didn't have any unexpressed thoughts. He just had to say something. So he blurts out, this is like the coolest thing ever. In fact, it's so cool, we should just stay right here on this mountain and build three shelters, one for Moses and one for Elijah and one for Jesus. We could have like a faith hall of fame right here. I mean, we got Moses and Elijah and Jesus. We got like the goats of all time right here. But right after he says that, God immediately shuts that ideal down and shuts Peter up. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Here's what that's telling us. Jesus is not one more prophet, teacher, or sage in a row. He does not fit into a category alongside others. He's not one among many or the first among equals. If the transfiguration reveals anything to us, it reveals Jesus is like no other and should never be categorized as just a good moral teacher, a great religious prophet, a cheap political mascot, or a strategic life coach. He is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Something else happens here that we need to point out. Peter, James, and John are in God's presence, and yet they do not die. 
On Mount Sinai, when God told Moses, no one can see my face and live, he was saying, you can't take my reality. You can't endure the presence of my holiness and the weight of my glory. It would destroy you. That's why Peter, though seriously misguided, suggests that three shelters be built. The word translated shelters here is actually the Greek word for tabernacle. After God's glory came down on Mount Sinai, the Hebrew people built a tabernacle. Why? Most religions have recognized there's a wide gap of some kind between deity and humanity. Therefore, many religions have temples or tabernacles with priests and sacrifices and rituals to transform your consciousness or take away your sin, to mediate the gap and protect human beings from the divine presence. What Peter's actually saying here is we need a tabernacle. We need to set up some boundaries to protect us from the presence of God. And immediately after Peter says this, a cloud appears and envelops Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And from within the glory cloud, God says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Peter, James, and John are clearly in God's presence, yet they do not die. How can that be? Suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. That's Mark's way of saying Moses is gone, Elijah is gone, and only Jesus is the bridge over the gap between God and humanity. Listen, Jesus is not only the human embodiment of the radiance of God's glory, but he's the only bridge into the presence of God's glory. Jesus is able to give what Elijah couldn't give, what Moses couldn't give, what no one else could deliver. Through Jesus, the gap has been crossed that can bring us into the very heart of the reality of the presence of God and live. Tim Keller said, Jesus is the temple and tabernacle to end all temples and tabernacles because he's the sacrifice to end all sacrifices, the ultimate priest to point the way for all priests. Oh, there's so much here. I wish I could put up a shelter right now and just preach on this for a while. (laughs) But there's more good stuff we got to get to. For example... We're told Moses and Elijah are talking with Jesus. Now think about that. Two guys who haven't been seen in hundreds of years suddenly appear on the top of that mountain and they're talking to Jesus. Wouldn't you love to know what they were talking about? Well, Luke tells us. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. The word departure is the Greek word for exodus. Do you see the irony here? Here's Moses talking to Jesus about an exodus. What exodus? The death and resurrection of Jesus that was about to go down in Jerusalem. That is the new and ultimate exodus. You see, in the first exodus, Moses led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and home to the promised land. In the new exodus, Jesus will lead all of God's people out of the slavery of sin and death and home to their promised inheritance, the new creation in which the whole world will be redeemed and restored. That's what Moses and Elijah and every prophet in between and after them were looking for. And that leads us to our second implication of the transfiguration. Secondly, Jesus is what the Bible is all about. Jesus is what the Bible is all about. When God spoke from the cloud, this is my son whom I love, listen to him, he was declaring Jesus is the fulfillment of the law represented by Moses. He will be the ultimate law keeper. Jesus is the promised one that the prophets write about, represented by Elijah, the greatest prophet ever. Everything that the prophets long for is carried on the shoulders of Jesus. And this is exactly what Jesus said after his resurrection when he appeared to two discouraged disciples on a country road heading out of Jerusalem. Luke tells us about that too in chapter 24. Jesus is sort of incognito and he joins two of his disciples who were crushed by his death on the cross and confused by reports of his body being gone from the tomb. So what does Jesus do to help them? Did he say, it's me, ta-da, told you so. Or as Pastor Dustin likes to say, it's me, psych. (laughs) No. Luke 24, 25 through 27. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Now think of those two guys on the mountain. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, 
He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Basically, he was saying, everything in the Old Testament is about me. Jesus is what the Bible is all about. Jesus is who the prophets long for. It's Jesus that the law pointed to. It's Jesus that the Bible is about. And as you study the word of God, you're meant to find more than theological wisdom and practical help for daily living. You're meant to find Jesus. You're meant to fall in love with Jesus. You're meant to find rest in Jesus. You're meant to find hope in Jesus. You're meant to surrender your life to Jesus. I like to say it like this. We preach the gospel and teach the Bible, but when the Bible's taught correctly, it will always preach the gospel. The gospel of Jesus' birth, life, death, burial, resurrection, appearance, ascension, and return. By the way, that's why I started telling people years ago when they say, Pastor John, I want to start reading the Bible. I'd say this, don't start in Genesis and try to read from front to back. Because if you don't stop on the back half of Exodus, Leviticus will shut you down. Start with Jesus and one of the gospels about him and then go to the next one and then go to the next one and then go to the next one. And once you know who Jesus is, you can let him lead you into the Old Testament books. After all, that's what Jesus did on the road to Emmaus. And I don't think I'm smarter than Jesus, do you? So after the greatest worship service ever is finished, they head back down the mountain. And the scriptures tell us that God often takes people up to the mountain to meet with them. But they don't get to stay on the mountain with him. Not yet anyways. And on the way down, fresh off this majestic moment, they're still trying to understand. They get into an interesting theological conversation. This is how Matthew records it, Matthew 17. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Why? Well, the full meaning of this episode would only be apparent after the resurrection because the transfiguration is a glimpse, a preview of the resurrection and of the second coming when Jesus will return to restore the world at the end of time. Also, until the resurrection, who in the world would believe these guys? We saw Moses and Elijah up on the mountain. One thing is clear to the disciples. By speaking of his resurrection... Jesus is once again pointing to his death. You know why? Because there's no resurrection unless someone dies. Then the disciples ask him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah's already come. They did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood he was talking to them about John the Baptist. In Matthew 16, the chapter right before Matthew 17, Jesus initially told the disciples, yes, I'm the Messiah, but then I'm going to suffer and die. And Peter rebuked Jesus, which led to Jesus rebuking Peter. And here again, Peter and the others push back on Jesus' suffering and death talk, but this time they're a little more cagey. They say, hey, you know, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? See, the Old Testament book of Malachi prophesied Elijah would return before the great day of the Lord when God would appear and make everything right. So the disciples are saying, hey, didn't we just see Elijah up there on that mountain? Wouldn't that mean the day of the Lord must be near? So why all this talk of suffering and death, Jesus? Jesus interprets it for them. I tell you, Elijah's already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. Jesus is saying that The Elijah, the prophet, was pointing to John the Baptist, and he's already suffered and died. Elijah had come and gone, and then he repeats, in the same way, the Son of Man must suffer at their hands. You see, just as Elijah's coming was a forerunner of the Lord's coming, so Elijah's execution, John the Baptist beheaded by Herod, is a precursor of the Lord's execution. Think about it this way. When Jesus was baptized, the spirit descended on him like a dove and it fortified him to begin teaching and healing publicly. Now, once again, the father envelops him with his presence, the light and the glory and the voice to fortify him for a far greater test that awaits him as he moves resolutely toward his execution on the cross. And I think it's not only Jesus who's strengthened by this experience. I think God is also preparing the disciples for the test they will face when their leader is taken from them. 
Let me just pause right here and ask you, have you ever had an experience like that? I'm talking about when the compassion and love of another person helped you deal with your suffering. When someone's unconditional approval and encouragement transformed your fear into resolve. When an encounter with beauty seemed to neutralize your anxiety and give you hope. And if you got that kind of help more often, wouldn't you be different? Wouldn't trouble make you wiser, deeper, and stronger instead of bitter, hard, and joyless? Wouldn't suffering make you more compassionate rather than more cynical about human nature? Wouldn't failure be more likely to be productive in your life? Of course it would. But here's the question. Here's the problem. How are you going to get more of that kind of approval, that kind of encouragement, that kind of love without burning your friends and family out with your neediness? The answer for us, as it was the disciples, is worship. You must have access through worship to the very presence of God. You have to see clearly in your mind what God has done and is doing through Jesus. You have to experience a little foretaste of the embrace God's going to give you fully someday. You need to actually experience in your heart what you know in your head of God's love. You see, it's one thing to know the glorious creator God loves you and cares for you and holds you. But it's another thing to sense it, to experience it. Whatever life brings you, you will need those foretastes to nourish and strengthen you. The transfiguration is not just a smoke and mirrors trick to convince the disciples of Jesus' deity. No, it was a spectacular experience of collective worship that they're going to need for what lay ahead and especially for what's waiting for them at the bottom of that mountain. We read on. When they reached the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them. And the teachers of the law arguing with them, as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my son who, uh, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I ask your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. A contentious confrontation is going on among the teachers of the law, a crowd of other people, and Jesus' disciples, the one who hadn't gone up on the mountain. They're trying to exercise a demon, and it's not working. Evil is present, and everybody's confused. Let me just say this. What a stark contrast this must have been to what Peter, James, and John had just experienced on that mountaintop. They have seemingly left heaven and entered hell. And this is a good and needed reminder that sometimes right on the heels of your most intense spiritual encounters with the Lord, those high holy moments, those mountaintop experiences where you've never felt so close to God, the very next moment, seemingly all hell breaks loose. We shouldn't be surprised because it happened to Jesus. Right after his baptism in the Jordan River, he hears the affirming, loving voice of God. He sees the life-giving presence of the Spirit in the form of a dove. And then he's immediately taken into a wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. And Pastor Dustin just did a great sermon on that last week. Remember this. As you grow on your faith, new levels, new devils. New levels, new devils. You can, you, you can, you can count on that. Paul once put it like this. He said, a great door for effective work is open to me, and there are many who oppose me. The doors of opportunity always swing on the hinges of opposition. You know that, right? The doors of opportunity always swing on the hinges of opposition. I like to say it like this. Where there's a door, there's a war. Wherever there's a door in your life, there will be a war. Opportunity and opposition are like the parallel railroad tracks that exist in simultaneous reality in this present world. Let me just say this. The gospel writers take the, pres the existence of demonic activity, a continued battle against evil, personal, supernatural beings as a self-evident aspect of reality, as a fact of life. Not everyone is personally possessed by a demon like the boy in this story, but Paul says in Ephesians 6 and many other places that everyone is fighting demonic powers and principalities all the time. The boy in this story is possessed by a demon making him deaf and mute, causing convulsions. It's an overwhelming physical and spiritual condition. 
that not only renders the boy helpless, but also stymies everyone around him. His father, the disciples, teachers of the law. The story continues. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Pastor Joby Martin points out that if you look at the ministry of Jesus and over 60% of his healings, he first cast a demonic presence out, then healed the patient, and in many cases, casting out the demonic brought the healing. And that's exactly what happens here. They bring the boy to Jesus. When the spirit sees Jesus, it immediately throws the young man into convulsions. He fell to the ground. He rolled around. He foamed at the mouth. Why? Because the demon knew what was coming. In the gospel accounts, the demons are always the first to recognize the presence and power of Jesus, and the religious leaders are usually the last. Think about that. The reason demons recognize Jesus is because they see him for who he really is, and they tremble. The number one question demons ask Jesus is, what are you going to do to us? The number one question religious people ask Jesus is, why are you hanging around people like that? And Jesus' number one answer is, the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. It's been said many times the church is not a museum to entertain the saints, but a hospital to treat the sinners. And that means that things can get messy around churches that are reaching a lot of lost people, like Journey is. Friends, emergency rooms aren't the place to go for a nap and a snack that Pastor Dustin talked about a few weeks ago. And for those of you who think you need to get your act together before you come to church or follow Jesus and be baptized, that's like saying you need to stop the bleeding before you go to the ER. Jesus never runs from your mess. He runs toward your mess. That's what he does here. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has it been like this? From childhood, he answered. It's often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse. Many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. The disciples were trying to exercise a demon, which Jesus had previously given them authority to do, but they were apparently trying to exercise it without praying. How arrogant and clueless they are about their inadequacy to deal with evil and suffering in the world. The disciples tried prayerless exorcism for the same reason they couldn't understand why Jesus had to die. They didn't see how weak and proud they were. They underestimated the power of evil in the world and in themselves. Listen, we underestimate our ability to deal with suffering, but we overestimate our ability to deal with Satan. Only one figure in this entire scene acknowledges his weakness, admitting he does not have what it takes to handle the suffering and evil that he faces, and that's the father of the boy. The man asked Jesus, can you heal my son? Jesus says, everything is possible for him who believes. The father says, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. That is, I'm trying, but I'm full of doubts. I struggle. And then Jesus heals the man's son. Now, this is really good news, and I don't think you understand how good of news this is. Through Jesus, we don't need perfect righteousness, just repentant helplessness to access the presence of God. Amen. Now, that's good news. It's better news than what you just said. Let me say it one more time. Through Jesus, we don't need perfect righteousness, just repentant helplessness to access the presence of God. Jesus could have told this father, I am the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Therefore, purify your heart, confess all your sins, get rid of all your doubts, your double-mindedness. Once you've surrendered to me totally and come before me with a pure heart, then you can ask for the healing you need. But Jesus doesn't say that, not at all. The boy's father basically says, I'm not a very faithful man. I don't know much about the Bible. I'm riddled with doubts. I can't muster the strength necessary to meet my moral and spiritual challenges. But Jesus, could you help me anyway? Friends, that's saving faith. That's faith in Jesus, not in yourself. 
perfect righteousness is impossible for us. And if you wait for it, you will never come into God's presence. You must admit that you're not righteous, but you trust Jesus' righteousness. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And when you can say that, you're approaching God in worship. We cannot leave this peak and valley story without an acute awareness of what Jesus is about to lose. He has lived for endless ages in glory with a father. On the mountain, we see Jesus surrounded by God, but soon on the cross, he'll be forsaken by the father. On the mountain, we see the life he's always led, embraced and clothed with the love and the light of God. But on the cross, he will be naked in the dark. Why did Jesus put himself through that? We know the answer. He did it for us. Paul tells us clearly that evil is unmasked and defeated at the cross. He writes to, in his letter to the church at Colossae, that Jesus disarmed the power and authorities, triumphing over them by the cross. And on the mountain, through the Spirit, God was strengthening Jesus for his mission, for the infinite suffering he would endure to defeat evil once and for all. And God can empower us in the same way to face evil and overcome our own suffering. You may know in your head that God loves you, but sometimes the Spirit makes it especially clear to you that that's the case. Sometimes you go to the mountain. Sometimes through the Spirit, you can hear God make a statement of unconditional, permanent, intimate love. And sometimes you just don't know about God's love. And the only prayer you can muster is, I do believe, Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. When you have pursued God in repentant helplessness, you will have worshiped. And every time you sense his embrace, your soul will shine the slightest bit brighter with his reflected glory. And you will be the slightest bit more ready to face whatever life has in store for you. Join me in prayer right now. Father, we come today. And there may be some of us that feel a mountaintop experience is happening in our life. We have seen the glory of God. We've heard the voice of God. We know that we know in our heart of hearts, not just our head, that you love us. And we are so grateful because Jesus is the only bridge. He's the only mediator between us and you that can make that happen. We can come into your presence in the name of Jesus and live. And we thank you for that. But there may be many here today or online or in Lake County. And they're desperate and they're sad. Just like that dad. Some, there may be someone that's, that's watching, that's in the room or it's in Lake County and they know the pain that only a parent can know that we see in that boy. Jesus, can you help me? If you can, Lord, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Maybe that's the best prayer we can utter right now, but Jesus, you love to hear that and you will respond and you will be over everything when we say, Jesus, I come. I'm not trusting in my righteousness. I'm trusting in your righteousness. Help me overcome my unbelief. Father, for anyone now who needs to make a statement like that, pray a prayer like that, or make a decision to follow Jesus, I pray you'll help them right now. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.